Mark van Neuland. He's the Bovar Program Director, sorry, Program Director at uh, DSM, um, and he's been leading the Bovar activity globally, innovation, regulatory, commercialization, manufacturing. But most importantly, it's nice to welcome back to New Zealand without quarantine. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Taking away my opening note, indeed, uh, last time I was here was two years ago. I enjoyed the mandatory hospitality of MIQ. So very happy that this time I arrived and actually thereafter could directly meet with friends and colleagues, but also with many of you here and over the past days. So uh, a much more nice environment to come into. Um, today I will speak about the journey of Bovair, not from an innovation perspective, but also really all the way to commercialization, right? Because indeed we are a bit further along that journey. Um, any questions at the end, uh, my details are also included, so feel free to reach out at any moment afterwards, because I know uh, the app only can handle so many questions, and I'm sure there's plenty of questions and interest uh, after what I've heard over the last days. Now, let's see if I get the technology to work. That looks good. So, um, I think Andy already did a great job setting this up uh, yesterday. We see uh, the world is warming up, right? Uh, not a big surprise, I think everybody here agrees with that. Uh, and we need to take action, and we need to take action fast. And what is then the way to do so? This is what was discussed, particularly at COP26, right, in Glasgow, um, where it was said, okay, well, how do we avoid, or how do we slow down the warming? And there, methane becomes a very important element. Now, the Global Methane Pledge was agreed there. The Global Methane Pledge is a 30% reduction in absolute methane reductions, in absolute methane emissions, to be very clear by 2030. So this is not about intensity, this is really about absolute emissions reductions that are required across all sectors. Um, at COP26, 100 countries signed up, COP27 has already increased to 150 countries, so it's mostly most of the world these days. Um, and what we, what's interesting, earlier this year, also the first dairy company actually said, hey, we will measure ourselves and we set our objectives along with the methane pledge. So the known today has committed to reduce their methane emissions by 30% by 2030, and will start reporting on this separately, uh, independently. So also in their sustainability reports, they will start not only about CO2 equivalents, but also look at methane emissions specifically. Now this will have an influence on the supply chain of the known, right? Because they cannot do so without actually having their suppliers deliver this, so this will trickle down. A bit building on the discussion earlier today, this is really driven by some of the big international customers that will say, hey, what do we need to do to reduce? Now, at the same time, we see a quite an increasing pressure on offsets. So we had discussion yesterday about offsets, uh, a little bit less today. But what we see is offsets are becoming less acceptable. So they don't count for your science-based targets initiatives as such. Uh, we see particularly companies uh, in Europe at this moment being brought to court over offsets. So for example, on the left bottom, it's, it's Arla, which actually was brought to court because they got a net zero dairy milk, dairy product through offsets, and this is not fitting with consumer perception and is misleading. So they had to withdraw this because they cannot do it in their own chain. We see the same in the airlines, etc. So this is really happening. So what we have in essence uh, is then you need to reduce in your own chain. And that's where the pressure is really starting to emerge. So you need to do and see what can you do in your own chain um, rather than trying to get something outside of your chain. And this is called basically insetting. So insetting is allowed with science-based targets initiatives. This is, I think, where you see much more focus as we go along. And then, of course, if you start thinking about everybody that uses milk, meat, or some of the derivatives thereof, uh, there's a lot of people that will need to inset reductions from the meat and livestock sector. Um, and we believe that particularly if you combine that focus on methane, which I, from the Global Methane Pledge, combined with the need for insetting, those two trigger that, hey, there need to be solutions, right? And I think that has been very clear over the last days. And those solutions uh, need to be safe, efficacious, and scalable, because otherwise it still doesn't help. So that's um, a little bit what has been our journey, right? Because I often get the question, hey, that's nice and fine, you're, you're where you are, but what does this look like? So we try to summarize what has been our 10-year journey from a registration perspective? And what you actually think, see, and that's quite funny, showing efficacy is probably the easiest part of the whole equation. 
it's all the other work that is required. Uh, and just to give you a flavor of that. Now, no surprise, you start, of course, with ideation, proof of concept. Hey, does it, what could work? How do I do your screening? Uh, do some early mode of action understanding, select candidates, etc. <coughs> Sorry. You then optimize this, so understanding what's the right dose range, uh, how do you produce this at scale, uh, you have some of the confirmation trials, uh, do some process development, and then you start to get the registration pathway. Now, in most countries, most regions, all you need is three efficacy studies, actually. So you only need three studies to show the product works. The piece that's really uh, much more cumbersome is actually all the safety studies you need to do. So this is over 100 studies. Uh, you need to do also stability studies, uh, uh, analytical methods development. So actually, if you print this out, this whole registration package, it's probably taller than I am. So I will always wish the regulators good luck when they receive our dossier, because it's even easy, not easy anymore to send this digitally. Uh, it's a lot of, lot of paperwork, right? Um, and what you then see is thereafter you get to commercialization, oh, sorry, and in the registration it's, it's really specific what you need to show. So for example, you need to show on the animal safety side that if you feed two, three, four, five times the maximum dose, there's a non-inferiority. So there's no difference in dry matter intake, there's no difference in milk production, no difference in milk composition. If you cannot do that, you will not pass the bar. So those are quite important elements which you need to demonstrate at scale. Um, this is also one of the reasons why we actually started with our registration or did some of our registration work uh, in Europe, so where we see some of the strictest safety, environmental and efficacy hurdles to pass. Now 90 to 95% of this work is applicable globally. So what we sometimes need to do is one additional study in a, in a specific system, uh, but that's about it. Uh, and of course, there's a continuous feedback loop, right? So once you get to a commercial stage, you learn uh, different applications, you actually think, can I have more a different form, different application, and you go through that iteration again. Fortunately, that doesn't take 10 years, so it's a bit shorter, but it does give you an indication of what's required. Um, and today, we are in that step four, where today we are uh, currently ready, have approval in 45 countries, are commercializing in those, uh, are reaching roughly 100,000 cows already today. Um, then, specifically for New Zealand, we have discussed what is a slow release format, how can you do something that you feed twice a day. Uh, that work actually started in New Zealand with the University, uh, uh, with Ag Research and University of Otago. Um, this work has now advanced quite a bit, was held up by COVID because some of the, some of the research sites were closed, but nowadays they're open again, making good progress. So this is some of the prototypes that are actually uh, will feed in, in, Span in Spain later this month. Well, later, already in March, but basically in March we'll start feeding this uh, slow release prototypes, which are in an industrial scale, because that was important for us to really see how do you scale it, how do you use it thereafter. Um, Bovair has now been approved in already 45 markets globally, so this is a map of the world. Um, and is being used in those uh, just a year ago. So basically, if I would have stand, stood here two, a year ago, there would only have been two dots. So that's the speed at which this is now happening with. Um, we expect, actually, we announced that last week, that North America, actually US, sorry, would get approval in the first half of 2024. So this is also an important step for us. Um, New Zealand, we have some date. We have, in all honesty, we have no idea. I think that based on the discussion also, I think the ambiguity that's uh, today still in the regulatory system, um, it's our best guesstimate. We hope for it. We hope to bring it to market quickly, but it's a very big unknown. Um, and as you then go into commercialization, you have your market approvals. We actually work quite closely with our customers for additional follow-on work and questions that they might have. So this is one of the most recent studies we finished actually uh, in Australia. So in Australia, to, together with the University of New England, looked at the meat quality, because that's of course a, quite, a very important element, uh, particularly in the beef sector. Um, there, the tested the, in the different uh, types of steaks, this is a rump steak specifically, um, looking at MQ4 scores, which actually what they look at is the taste, the juiciness, uh, flavor, combining all of that, and what you then see, the higher the score, the better 
the, the elements, of course, uh, there's no difference, right? And this gives a lot of confidence to that. So today we are in three of the lights, large, three of the large, three of the five largest feedlots in Australia already. Um, and actually, Australia is one of our biggest markets today. Now, all of this, and this is my last slide, we cannot do without partners, right? This is a really a collaborative effort, both with commercial partners, and many of the logos you will recognize here, I'm sure, as well as with um, academic institutions. So over more than 60 trials have been conducted in over 18 countries, four continents. Uh, there's a bit of a flavor for what this is globally where those markets have been. Um, what you also see, and that's the piece I'm most proud of, just over the last 12 months, we already enabled the reduction of 30,000 tons of CO2. There are countries which now today already have applied this to more than 3% of their dairy herd, and thereby reducing the dairy herd methane footprint by 1%. And that doesn't sound a lot, but just six months after market approval, getting to that stage is very significant. And of course, uh, we hope that the 30,000 tons will very quickly hit 100,000 tons, and I think that will still happen this year. Uh, so looking forward to that. Thank you very much for your attention.